Hello again, and welcome to Denton's Tales. Now for yet another collection of the unexplainable, the unknown, the strange, events that can only be seen as paranormal or supernatural, since no scientific or, or natural cause can be attributed to them. As Sherlock Holmes put it, when every possible explanation has been ruled out, Whatever remains, however improbable it may seem, must be the truth. To start, a personal experience uh, of my own. For several years after I purchased uh, this, this house, back in 1983, we had a recurring and decidedly unwelcome experience for which no logical explanation exists. Fish, yes. Yes, that's what I said, fish. Or, or rather, the, the smell of fish. Rotten fish. Very rotten fish. A stomach-turning, nauseating stench of fish that were decidedly past their use-by date. No no explanation, you say? Oh, God, oh that's ridiculous. I mean, dead fish do tend to you know, get rather obvious to the olfactory senses after a while. They certainly pong, so... What's the mystery? Perfectly, perfectly natural thing. Long expired fish smell caused by, well, long expired fish. Yes, 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 they do. They do. They certainly do. But you see, in that case, one actually needs some rather out of date fish to do the smelling. But since the upstairs front bedroom in this semi-detached council house contained no fish, and it never had, yet it managed to smell like the entire Dublin fish market on a very hot day, well, we, we, we have a slight problem. A smell with nothing to cause it. A, a self-creating odour, you might say. Now, this smell only ever occurred in the front bedroom, as I said, and, and only uh, intermittently. It would come one day, but not the next, one week, but not the next, and, and so on. And this went on for several years. On walking into the room, the powerful fishy pong sort of hit one in the face. It was like a, a wall of highly odiferous fish. The, the nearest shop that sold fish was like a quarter of a mile away, and in any case, the smell was never noticed outside, nor in, in any other room of the house but that front bedroom, in, including the other two bedrooms right beside it. Naturally, I checked around outside as well, examined the drains, did all that, but the smell was only ever noticed inside the house and in that one room. Now, I tried the usually recommended things, you know, salt sprinkled at doors and windows, burning white sage and, uh, and so forth. And it, the smell began to reduce gradually over the years, growing less frequent and less potent until it stopped altogether. We were very thankful uh, for that. After doing some research into fishy smells for no obvious reason, I discovered that an overpowering stench of rotten fish was considered to be a sign of Demogorgon, the archangel of hell. Now, why fish should be demonic, I, I really don't know, uh, even dead smelly ones. Nor, nor why the archangel of hell would be sitting around smelling up the main bedroom in a Dublin semi-detached council house. You know, one would assume that such an important, high-ranking official of hell would have something better to do with his time than smelling up bedrooms. Your explanation is as good as mine, especially since I don't actually have one. And in case you've never smelled it, there's no mistaking the pong of rotten fish. Oh, no. Take my word for that. On several occasions when passing the door to the living room in this house, voices have been heard in the room, at least at least two voices, seemingly a couple having a rather whispered conversation. But on opening the door and going into the room, yes, you guessed it, there's nobody there. As I said, this has happened a number of times. Now the tale of a Ouija board. Oh, yes, a Ouija board. Now, I've, I have never used one, nor would I, as those who have say that they are to be avoided unless you really know what you're doing and probably even avoided in that case, as it is said to be easier to bring something in than to send it back afterwards. 
I certainly have no intention of testing that theory. My mother didn't use them either. She was a bit, bit wary of them, and after what I'm about to relate, she certainly had no intention of starting. But she was with some friends who had one, and they wanted her to join in, and, and so she did. Someone else was actually using the board, and my mother made a comment about one of the answers it had given, a comment that apparently upset the board rather badly. The clearly highly offended board rose up off the table and shot straight across the room at my mother, who had to jump out of the way to avoid being hit. That encounter with a homicidal Ouija board destroyed any budding interest she might have had in ever using one. I wonder why. Oh, well. Anyway, now for a theatrical ghost, and one who was very well aware of people around him. He had conscious awareness, which is a very important uh, point in relation to uh, the story and in ghostly sightings in general. A very, very close friend of mine who I value greatly told me of two very strange incidents that occurred around 1993 in an old Victorian theatre in the state of Georgia, the Springer Opera House in Columbus, built in 1871 and well known, it seems, for supernatural activity. The great American actor Edwin Booth is said to haunt the building, wandering around wearing a top hat, having been seen quite a number of times. And strange things have happened in the costume loft, with things being moved, or in one case, after an actress expressed the need for new shoes, a pair of shoes mysteriously appeared, which leads me into my friend's account rather nicely. She had actually heard coat hangers uh, being moved around behind her in the uh, costume loft, but when she would look, well, there, there was no one there. She was completely alone. One day, she was in the costume loft when she became aware of, of movement above her. Looking up at a sort of gallery that uh, ran around the room, she saw a man leaning on the railing, looking down at her with obvious interest. He was staring right at her, but there was nothing threatening about him, though his attire was, well, unusual to say the least. He looked like Colonel Saunders from the Kentucky Fried uh, Chicken chain. The goatee beard, the white suit, he was the archetypical southern colonel of Confederate days. But I mean, this was a theatre. He, he could have been trying on, on costumes. Anyway, she, she nodded to him and left the area. Nothing about him gave any indication that he was anything other than a normal man, though somewhat strangely dressed. About a year later, she was attending a performance in the theatre, and as she was going up the main stairs along with a, n a number of other people, she saw the antebellum southern gentleman coming down the stairs against the upward flow of people, coming straight towards her, and he was looking at her. She mentions that his eyes were an unnaturally bright piercing blue, but slightly smiling, nothing, nothing threatening. As he passed her, he turned to look at her with what she described as a, a knowing expression. Now, surprised at seeing him again, she turned and looked behind her. But the man wasn't there. He'd completely vanished. Something, you know, most normal men don't, don't uh, tend to do. He couldn't have got down the stairs through the people coming up in the couple of seconds it took her to look back. And as she put it, all of a sudden, he wasn't there. My knees literally went weak. But there had been nothing about him to suggest anything otherworldly. On both occasions, she'd taken him for a normal man, which is what uh, he looked like, until he vanished, of course, which, as I said, normal men don't usually do. There are some interesting points about this. You know, he was not one of the usual phantoms, uh, uh, so to speak, as most ghostly sightings are, you know, the grey lady sort of thing, ethereal and often transparent, sometimes little more than a, a misty shadow. No, he seemed perfectly solid and normal. As I said, nothing about him struck her as, as strange. As she said, no, I thought he was real the first time. The second time I did also but was caught up in a crowd of people going up, I was amazed to see him, seeing me. And, you see, he, he, was, he was not some sort of recording of a past event replaying, as, as many hauntings do, do seem to be, a sort of, uh, I don't know, sort of a DVD-like 
thing playing uh, an event from the past. No, he had conscious awareness. He looked at her, even turning to look at her as he passed her. He knew she was there, and thus he was also there on the stairs at that moment. He was real. Or, well, as real as a dead person can be, I suppose. She was rather unnerved by that, but it, it faded from her memory after a while. She thought no more about the Colonel Sanders lookalike. But some years later, while browsing in a bookshop, she came across a history of the theatre, and looking through it, she saw a chapter entitled The Gentleman in the White Suit. Apparently, a number of people over the years had reported seeing a man dressed in that old southern manner. Naturally, she purchased the book, confirming, as it did, her own observations and, of course, her sanity. She wasn't imagining it. The antebellum gentleman was a reality, not a product of her own over-imaginative brain. But now for two really remarkable stories from a very trustworthy friend of mine. He said, and I quote, Once I was playing the piano, fantastic impromptu, just making it up, I felt I was being watched, so I turned around. About four metres away was a table, and under the table there was something, completely black, larger than a cat, smaller than a dog. It had red slits for eyes, and they glowed. I was so shocked, I, I fell backwards off the piano stool. I raced outside, totally freaking and shaking. I shook for a few minutes before calming and going back inside. But, but, but it... Of course, no, no one, no one will believe this. Well, I believe it. You know, it, it, uh, it, it seems like, well, a very believable thing to me, at least, for it to have scared him that much. Well, there had to, there had to be something, something there. But here's here's a second story from when he was eight years old, driving one winter night with his mother and sister. He says. We were coming back, it was a, a Tuesday night, it had been raining and the temperature dropped well below zero. An icy road, as you know in, in Europe, so my mum was driving very slowly along a road that the Romans had built. Anyhow, the car slid and went off the road, all, all very slowly, as she was driving slowly. My sister and I were in the back seat. The front passenger seat was empty. Now I looked over and I could tell my mum was upset. Then I looked at the front seat. And there was a man sitting there, dark, long hair and beard. But the most astonishing thing were his eyes. The best way to describe it was, and I was only seven or eight, eyes like burning gold, yellow with, with hints of red. And those eyes, those eyes knew everything about me, my past, my present and my future. I reached out my hand to my mum and I said, Jesus is sitting there. My mum said, what? She and my sister saw nothing at all. I don't know if it was Jesus or, or an angel. It only lasted a few seconds, but today I can still see the eyes, and I know there is nowhere I can hide from them, no matter how deep underground. And This is why I am both a scientist and a believer in the spiritual. I know what I saw. A remarkable story indeed. And yes, yes, my friend is a, a scientist, very level-headed and not prone to being fanciful and seeing men with rather interesting eyes who, who aren't there. Well, it gives extra credence to his accounts. So that concludes this look at the paranormal from my personal perspective. I hope you found it of interest. And I'll be looking further into this subject in part four. I hope you will join me once again for that one. So until then, I shall say goodbye for now. See you next time, hopefully.